Hi everyone, this is Josh Nelson with Keystone Financial Services. Welcome to Forecast 2012. We originally held this presentation at Marianna Butte Golf Course in Loveland, Colorado on January 25th, 2012. We thought we'd put a version of this out on the web so you could listen to it yourself, but also to pass on to family, friends, and work associates. So again, thank you for coming. We're going to have a little bit of fun today. That's important because our mission at Keystone is to build high trust relationships with our clients by providing exceptional service and unbiased financial advice in a caring, fun environment. Our objective at this event is to review where we've been, where we are, and where we may be going. So there were a number of big stories that happened in 2011, including the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, the budget battle in Washington, the death of Osama bin Laden, and the Arab Spring. But the biggest story affecting the markets was the financial crisis in Europe. Several European countries experienced severe budget problems, including Greece and Italy, and the European politicians really kept markets on edge. The three main causes of the crisis were excessive government spending, leading to excessive government debt, coupled with slow economic growth. And let's not forget another biggie, monetary union without fiscal union. Unlike many other years, the shifting political landscape had a tremendous effect on the financial markets. It seemed like every time a European leader said something, the markets moved either up or down. In fact, in 2011, there were 69 days in which 90% of the S&P 500 stocks moved in the same direction, more than the combined total from two other volatile years, 2008 and 2009, according to the Wall Street Journal. As CNBC said, when the history books are written, 2011 may go down as the year when political risk trumped economics, earnings, and interest rates as the main force driving capital markets. So part of the fun of the presentation is to take a look at what the pros were forecasting for 2011 and then compare how accurate their forecasts were. So here are four prominent market forecasters and what they projected for 2011. David Bianco from Bank of America Merrill Lynch said, we're broadly bullish on U.S. equities. Bob Dahl, not to be confused with Bob Dole, at BlackRock, forecast low double-digit returns, including dividends. If we're wrong, I think our forecast is too low, he said. Dan Chung from Alger Funds said stocks could rise more than 20% sometime in 2011, and Binky Chada from Deutsche Bank forecast the S&P 500 would rise 23% and close 2011 at 1550. So what did the S&P 500 actually do in 2011? What well, was exactly unchanged? All of these forecasters were way too bullish for the 2011 year. And they weren't the only ones who missed the mark in 2011. This was such a tough year, even though the market remained unchanged, that some very prominent investors got tripped up in the tricky market of 2011. Celebrated hedge fund manager John Paulson, the force behind what's been dubbed the greatest trade in history, bet on the coming subprime mortgage crisis in 2007 and personally made $3.7 billion on that bet. In 2010, he bet big on gold and made $4.9 billion on gold and other investments. But in 2011, he lost his golden touch and his primary fund lost 51% through sour investments in banks, insurance companies, and other financial services firms, and a Chinese company that had accounting problems. On December 19, 2010, superstar banking analyst Meredith Whitney appeared on a segment of CBS's 60 Minutes, titled The Day of Reckoning. Whitney warned millions of viewers to expect a spat of municipal bond defaults in 2011 amounting to hundreds of billions of dollars. So far, she's been wrong as the total outstanding par value of muni bonds that went into default for the first time this year is $1.68 billion, according to a December 13th report from Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Bill Gross, the co-founder of PIMCO and manager of the world's largest bond fund, bet heavily against U.S. Treasuries earlier in 2011, only to see them become one of the biggest outperforming asset classes of the year. The bad call sparked Gross to issue a formal apology to his investors in October, saying succinctly, I'm just having a bad year. And everyone's favorite, Warren Buffett even got stung in 2011. He invested $5 billion in Bank of America, and as of year end, the stock was down about 20% since the deal was announced on August 25, 2011. But don't worry, Buffett's a good long-term investor, so measuring him on that short time period really wasn't fair. In fact, as of February 8, 2012, year-to-date, Bank of America stock is up 41%. So one reason it's difficult to guess future stock prices is that figuring out where the economy is heading isn't so easy either. 
In December 2007, economists expected the economy to grow an average 2.4% in 2008, according to a survey of three dozen of them by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. It shrank 0.3% instead. For 2009, they forecast the economy would shrink 0.8%. It shrank 3.5%. So Fopper has a good point. You could say the stock market will drop 20%, but if you don't put a date on it, you've got lots of time for your prediction to come true. So in the past year, the S&P 500 was unchanged. The Dow Jones Global Index, excluding the U.S., so these were the foreign stocks, dropped 16.7%. The 10-year Treasury yield 1.9%, which was a significant reduction from where it ended a year ago. Gold was up for the 11th consecutive year. The Commodity Index dropped 134 and the Real Estate Investment Trust Index rose 7.5%. So generally speaking, it was a difficult year for the equity markets and commodities. India has been the best performing market since 2000, followed by China and Hong Kong. In fact, out of the eight major world markets covered in this chart, those are the only three with a positive return since January 2000. Notice the big spike of the blue and brown lines in the 2006 to 2008 period. That's China in blue and India in brown. They had major moves, and China in particular has come down pretty hard since then. So if we look back to 2000, since then, the best performing markets around the world would have been India, China, and Hong Kong. And as you can see, the United States has actually had a slightly negative return since 2000. India is the brown line, China the blue line, and Hong Kong the green line. So if you're wondering why our stock market hasn't gone anywhere since 2000, this chart helps explain why. The Q ratio is a popular method of estimating the fair value of the stock market developed by Nobel laureate James Tobin. See that spike in the blue line? Guess what year that was? It was the peak of the stock market bubble in early 2000. So the black center line is the average of this ratio back to 1900. Anytime the green or blue line is above the black line, that means the market was valued above its long-term average. And as you can see, the blue line was completely out of whack in early 2000. And even today, we're still not back below the long-term average. According to this ratio, the stock market is overvalued by about 15% from its long-term average valuation. At its peak in early 2000, the market was overvalued by 157% from its average. At its low in March of 2009, it was undervalued by just 7%. It's important to have appropriate expectations about the ups and downs of the stock market. Since 1942, we've experienced a bear market defined as a 20% drop from a previous high 11 times. That's an average of one every 6.3 years. We've had 22 corrections defined as a 10% drop, which averaged one every 3.1 years. So together, we've had a bear market or a correction on average every 2.1 years. So yes, the market does fluctuate. While we're still below the all-time high from late 2007, we have recovered sharply off the 2009 low. In fact, the market is up about 86% since the March 2009 bottom. This chart also shows how volatile 2011 was. We started the year with an increase, then had a mid-year 19.4% drop, then a year-end rally of nearly 17%. So when you take a look at how our market has recovered from this bear market compared to some of the other great bear markets of the past 100 years, you can see that we've clearly decoupled. Compared to the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression, the Japanese market from 1989 to the present, and the NASDAQ tech bubble, we tracked those declines for about two years but in the past two years, we've definitely decoupled, and you can see in this blue line that we're well above where the other bear markets were. So there are some negatives in our economy right now. The unemployment rate's improving, but it's still high. Our economic growth is still coming off of a major recession. The European debt problems are still there, and our housing market is still weak. So it's not all doom and gloom. Retail sales have been solid. Consumer debt load is going down. Consumer confidence hit an eight-month high in December, and after tax, corporate profits are at record highs. So what does the future look like? Well, we can turn to that eternal optimist, the actor, writer, and director, Woody Allen. More than any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other, to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. So let's take a look at some forecasts for 2012. Doug Cass is a prominent money manager and columnist for TheStreet.com. Here are three of his surprises for 2012. Number one, the U.S. stock market approaches its all-time high in 2012. Number two, the growth in the U.S. economy accelerates as the year progresses. And number three, former presidents Bill Clinton and George Bush form a bipartisan coalition that persuades both parties to unite in addressing our fiscal imbalances. 
Well, that all sounds pretty good, but how good of a forecaster is Mr. Cass? Well, in 2011, he was right about one thing. His biggest surprise for 2011 came true. The S&P 500 would end 2011 at the same price as the year before, and it did end exactly unchanged at 1257. Going back further over the past nine years, he's been right about 42% of the time in his annual list of surprises. But to be fair, these are not predictions, rather they're possible but improbable events. And here's what Goldman Sachs forecast for 2012. They say U.S. GDP up 1.8%, global GDP up 32 They say the S&P 500 operating profits of $100 a share. With the year-end S&P 500 price target at 1250 Interestingly enough, today on February 8th, we're a little bit north of 1300 so they actually expect the market to drop from where we are right now. They say 2012 inflation up 1.7%, and the closing yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury at 2.5%. That would be a fairly big jump because we're sitting just shy of 2% today. So there are several key themes that we're watching for 2012. First, the global economy might be weak. Potential contributors to that might include a possible recession in Europe brought on by their austerity measures, a potential widening of the euro crisis, and problems in China arising from a property bubble. In the U.S., corporate profits are at a record high, and at some point those profit margins might drop as companies exhaust their ability to cut costs and lay off staff. The housing market has been in a major slump for several years, and that continues to weigh on the economy. Housing starts at a seasonally adjusted annual rate, were running over 2 million in 2006. At the end of 2011, the number was down to less than 700,000. Prices are back to where they were in mid-2003, and the shadow inventory of foreclosed or delinquent homes is still north of 3 million. While this sounds negative, the backlog of homes should eventually get cleared out, and that could set the stage for a nice recovery down the road. The job market is still weak, and projected growth is not fast enough to substantially reduce the unemployment rate. As long as the unemployment rate is high, it's tough to increase consumer spending, which is a major driver of economic growth. Our annual federal budget deficit is currently very large and running in the $1.3 to $1.5 trillion range, which is dramatically worse than it has been in history. Congress has been butting heads all 2011 on this issue, and it's sure to rise again in 2012. On a state and local level, budgets are also being cut, and while that's painful in the short term, it might set the stage for longer-term, sustainable economic growth. So I think this is a pretty interesting chart. If you take a look at the yield on the 10-year Treasury note going back to the early 60s, you can see from the early 60s until the early 80s, there was pretty much a steady rise as it rose from below 5% to above 15%, and then from the early 1980s up until the last couple of years, there was pretty much a steady decline. So the big question now is have we reached a generational low in bond yields and are we now looking at another longer-term bear market in bonds? If investors lose confidence and interest rates rise rapidly like they have in Europe, that could be a major problem for our economy. When looking at this chart, you can understand why Bill Gross thought it was about time for Treasuries to start a new bond bear market. So as we start to wrap up, there are a few things that our kids will never have to do thanks to technology. Of course, you can see the answer on here. In our live presentation, we would have left you in suspense, but here they are. Thanks to technology, our kids will never have to write a check. And thanks to technology, our kids will never have to buy a set of encyclopedias. Thanks to technology, our kids will never have to use a payphone at a phone booth. And finally, thanks to technology, our kids will never have to stop at a gas station and ask for directions. So Wilbur Wright said, it's not really necessary to look too far into the future. We see enough already to be certain it will be magnificent. Only let us hurry and open the roads. So when it's all said and done, we're optimistic about the future. We know there will be ups and downs along the way, and we'll do our best to navigate the tough times on your behalf. And if there's anything else that we can do to help you reach your hopes and dreams in the future, please let us know. Thank you for attending today. And please feel free to share this information with a friend. Let us know who you would like us to send information about the services that Keystone Financial Services provides. Allow them to experience the difference. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC, and an investment advisor.